Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the DXM podcast. That is Deminty Times Mocha. I am joined today by Carla Gannis, uh, incredible artist. Carla, welcome to the show. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here, and we're going to start where we start with everybody and ask you to please share anything you would like to about yourself. Sure, Colburn, thank you so much for having me. And I really love this series, so it's really great to be part of it today. Thank you. And, you know, I know this is a question you lead with, but I kind of purposefully didn't prepare. I was like, just what is going to come in the moment? What am I going to think of? And so uh, I guess, and I think, you know, some of your guests do this, there's the way back machine for those of us who've been doing this for a little bit, right? And so, you know, I've been in New York City for like 28 years working as a digital artist. And I came out of painting, threw away all my paintings. I had to be really dramatic about it when I decided <laughs> that, you know, I really wanted to pivot and I wanted to embrace, you know, making art in my own time. And that was during mm. the days of Web 1.0. I also was working in industry, you know, as a web designer and Web 1.0 was, you know, a kind of monumental time too. And so that's why all of what's been happening now is really fascinating to me and, you know, as a person who generally is an early adopter of things, I've wanted to participate, but there are so many conversations to have about the complexities of all this too. And then just quickly, I'll just do a rundown. 28 years, really fast. No. Um, <laughs> so I also teach, so I have been teaching digital arts, communications design, all of those different things at Pratt Institute. And then for the past three years, I've been at NYU and I'm in an engineering school, which is yeah. really cool. And we're the art and design program in this engineering school. So we get to do weird stuff with tech. And oh my gosh, I know we were supposed to have like sound control, but I can't help the person honking their horn outside. You know, hear that? <laughs> Look, it's New York after all. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You need it that. It wouldn't be, exactly. It wouldn't be New York if you didn't yeah. have those sounds. Okay, well, cool. So um, I won't let that deter me from finishing the 28 year, you know, kind of <laughs> brief uh, history. So um, I've been doing that. I, you know, help run an XR lab. My own practice is something that I call multimodal. I call myself, I've got, I've, I've had many different titles right now. You know, it's a transmedia, interdisciplinary, digital artist, most importantly, an artist. I work with all sorts of different technologies, but I also really foreground the ideas, the concepts, and kind of having a core concept or narrative that then I can explore across media platforms. And that's something that's really exciting to me, that it can be a sculpture, it can be a file. It starts with the file always, uh, but it can then be a drawing, it can be a print, a, you know, all of these different potentialities. And really, what is the point of labeling yourself when you're constantly like pushing out beyond yourself? Um, yeah, I, I find that, you know, your practice just continues to push levels of identity. Uh, I think you speak to just again, like the multifaceted individual. So maybe you would be the right person to ask if there has been an evolution of, you know, for you, like web one, web two, web three and how people have begun to kind of like use and embrace and adopt and, and morph into these tools? Oh, that's a really good question. And, you know, the early days of NetArt Web 1.0, if you remember MTAA, the art starts here and it's between that connection, you know, the servers. And I have been fascinated by all of this for a long time. In 1998, I wrote my first avatar. Her name was Sister Gemini. And uh, I was working with flash-based technologies back then. So I really wanted to kind of push things out into the web that were animated and mm. um, working with, you know, within the limitations of back then, but dreaming, you know, something that would be larger, like the holodeck. That's my thing, you know. Right. Yeah. And um, Sister Jim and I hacked into websites via playing an electronic dulcimer and you know it was just kind of otherworldly and i had a lot of fun with that and i was following what a lot of other people were doing and then as we get to web 2.0 i started working oh my gosh this year it's 10 years i started working with kalani nicole transfer gallery mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh back in 2013 and that was really monumental because i had been working with galleries at least in new york 
for a while that weren't specifically digital art galleries. So a lot of times my work, if it was collected, was collected as a photograph or, you know, a moving image work, but never, you know, the file or any of this interactive work that I'd been doing for years. I'd made flash games, these kind of things. And working with Kalani was, was really crucial in terms of feeling like I was really part of a family that, you know, we could all mutually support each other's practice. And I think that's something that's extended into Web3 and is mm -hmm. really excited. And it's morphed in interesting ways, but that still, you know, I think the, the focus being on the art and the focus being on community and the focus being on, hey, we are doing something revolutionary here, you know, working with networks, working with um, just, I call it, uh, you know, digital semiotics, of course, but also just contemporary, contemporary vernacular, you know, mm -hmm. the language we just speak as a culture that then we can filter into our art. Yeah. Ah, oh, good, 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 good. Um, it's, it's, gosh. You know, I, I want to talk also about probably your attraction to New York City and it kind of consistently being this this hub. Do you find, you know, we, we talk about this global movement, of course, but do you find that there's just like because of the frenetic, energetic nature of the city, that it is kind of mirroring the way that these online digital communities are being built? That is a good question because I just don't feel, you know, I love New York. I've been here for a really long time, but I feel we we're talking about decentralization and decentralization. You know, I'm taking it in a broader kind of scope of that people can be anywhere. I mean, when I first, right. you know, started working with artists on transfer and then throughout the pandemic, I met somebody last night and I was like, where are you based? I don't know where anyone, you know, is physically rooted anymore so often. And so many people I've had, you know, friendships for years that I've never met in person. I thrive in New York. I, you know, teach here. I do everything in Brooklyn and Bushwick, Brooklyn. I'm a big proponent of Brooklyn, although mm -hmm. Manhattan school too. But I don't think it is necessary to be here. And and actually, you know, throughout the pandemic, I was thinking about different places, you know, that I, you know, might experiment with living in. And it wasn't so easy then. But even now, I'm still open to that. You know, I'm open to LA, perhaps, or this summer. I always get kind of strange ideas when I travel. And I finally got to travel again because I love to travel. I was in Estonia and I thought, wow, mm. Tallinn, Estonia. I did a museum show there. And yeah. I was like, whoa, maybe I could, you know, like uh, kind of uh, settle here or, you know, do some big move. And so I don't feel that New York is crucial to my practice and crucial to kind of what's going on, you know, in the Web3 world. But... One thing as, you know, someone who delves into XR quite a bit and I teach it, I, you know, incorporate it into my own works, particularly VR, is a lot of times we get into this mind-body dualism and we're just like, oh, well, the body isn't part of this. But the body, locality, positionality, placemaking, all of that is part of it as well. And there's no way that we can imagine that. And the last thing I'll say on this topic is I came from a town of 7,000 people in this uh, really, you know, in North Carolina, so in the southern part of the United States. And I built a model of New York City when I was in third grade. So I was already thinking about, you know, <laughs> getting out of this small town and thinking about world building too. And right. so I think that was another reason it was, you know, it, it, it took some work for me to, to get up here. And so that's another reason I've, I've stayed rooted here for now. Hello, Kitty. Oh my gosh. What's, he likes to hang name? out. His name is Akuchi. Uh, Hi, he's, Akuchi. He's very jealous and attached. Yeah. Oh, my kitty's <laughs> over here. Bashi is his name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Hi, Akuchi. Yeah. It's it's not an internet show without a couple cats. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, let's talk more just about you know metaverse and and world building, and I'm sure you've seen various hype cycles around AR, VR, all of this you know coming connection and. Uh, what what ultimately do you make of it and what are the feelings that you want to kind of like pass down or perpetrate by the advancement and sharing of this technology? All right, perpetrate, yes, instantiate. 
So there have been a lot of cycles. There have been winters. I also am working with machine learning and AI and have been mm -hmm. doing that for several years. Although somebody on Twitter recently asked the question, how long have you been working with AI? And I answered, conceptually, I've been working with it for over 20 years. When I first created this avatar who was this kind of AI identity. But I've been working with the actual technology now for about five years. And I think that all of these technologies can be very seductive. And I have to admit there are times where something is released and a new release of software does not a paradigm shift make. But it is really seductive because you start to feel like a wizard. Or what is hmm. that Arthur C. Clarke quote? Any advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so it's like magic and you want to, you know, kind of do something with it. And I think through that element of play, a lot of times discovery can happen. But I also need to ground myself, and I think we all do on some, some level, need to ground ourselves. And we each have our own pace. We each have our own you know, way we participate in hype cycles or not, you know, or mm -hmm. denigrate things or you know, like stay cool about it. And for me, I like to experiment. But then I kind of step back and, and ask myself, what is the value proposition here? You know? So what am I adding to culture and society by using this particular, particular technology? And as you already mentioned, a lot of my work really delves into identity. Right now, I have seven different avatars you know, that are ongoing as it's part of this project called Wonder Camera, this decolonized feminist uh, re-establishment of what a Wonder Camera could be in the 21st century online and metaverse spaces. And... I think I am still answering your question, but I could digress because I tend to digress a lot. I go down all those forking paths. But, <laughs> it's all interesting yeah. to me. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think just the core of this is, you know, for me is making sure that I'm rooting or grounding my technological practice in something that is really committed to ideas or again, narrative or storytelling or adding something to culture and society in the best way possible. Look, I, I, it's so interesting to me, this thought as well, because all throughout kind of like the emergence of NFTs, we saw blocks and pockets of advancement in AI technologies, artists moving to these tools and then immediately trying to like find and assign value to it. Right. Yes. And so you have all these high prices and then just like this immediate fall off once a new tool is released. And I find it both fascinating to kind of track those progressions in those AI artworks, but also recognize like how accessible immediately it was to so many different types of people. And then just watch like that value be created and kind of destroyed. And it happens so, so fast. Um, and we see it just like again and again and again. Uh, yeah. How, how do you feel? Yeah. How do you feel about like the ability now to just immediately assign like value and, and capital and the ability for somebody to collect something that just kind of because of its novelty, it's so highly praised immediately, but then because it's so accessible, it kind of just... Yeah, those are really important questions. I mean, and speaking to the kind of accessibility of a lot of these programs and, and they explode, what was it, Lenza AI a couple yeah. weeks ago and all the selfies. And of course I participated, you know, <laughs> but I, and then I tried to complicate it. So I decided I wanted to use Lenza. I wanted to use Mid Journey. I wanted to use Clayform AI, a, a AI platform I've been working with for several years. And so the two different kind of image sets that were uh, generated by Midjourney and Lenza, I then fed into Clayform. And I was like, what happens if we start to make, you know, there's a lot of talk about mixed media art, but like mixed AI art, mixed algorithm art, and to complicate those things. And so that's what mm -hmm. I'm always looking to do is, is to complicate. 
uh, things and and sometimes to a fault. I am a maximalist, and you know I, I use this Latin term horror vacui, but you know this fear of empty places. And I, behind mm. me, I have a piece I made called the Garden of Emoji Delights, which is case in point that you know uh, an articulation of you know this horror vacui. But I also think through this process, I'm speaking to how hypermediated we are, and speaking right. to these hype cycles, and speaking to also tech obsolescence. So I've been working with all these different technologies. A lot of times you adopt proprietary platforms and then later it's a it's incumbent upon you as an artist a lot of times to update things and migrate things and that can be really difficult, you know. And um and so, you know, following kind of hype cycles, following the release of, you know, these increasingly more accessible softwares, part of me always wants to dabble in them and experiment with them, or I'm, you know, working with students who might be incorporating them into something they're doing for class or whatever. And I'm really open to that. But also, again, as I was saying before about kind of, it, I'm a person who likes to kind of fly through things. That's why I love metaverse spaces. I love being able to fly, right? When I first got <laughs> on Second Life, that was my favorite thing, you know? Right. And, and, um, I ran a race against one of my avatars in 2010. She was in Second Life and I ran down the middle of a highway in, in physical reality and she was in a, a highway in Second Life, but she could fly if a car came along, you know, and so really you're kind of thinking about all this stuff. But, um, but yeah, okay, I meandered again, but back to your point or back to your question, um, you know, I, I think that experimentation is really important in this field. I think that we all have to kind of embrace an elasticity. God, I can't say that word. Elasticity. Elasticity. Yeah. Elasticity. Yeah, elasticity. I call it, you know, kind of, um, you know, hybrid identity. And all of that is good. But then also, sometimes we're banking on these things. I mean, I've been really excited for a lot of young artists who don't have to just do design work. They could actually sell their work. They could build yeah. collector bases. But having been doing this for a while, I remember early on, there were people whose careers, you know, I wanted to have when I was in my 20s, for example. Right. And there are vicissitudes to all of this. And I like to use the metaphor of um, running and I've run marathons in the past and I like to apply that to my practice too because one I mm. suck at sprints but <laughs> I like to think about you know the the marathon the like commitment to a practice for the rest of your life and yeah. as someone who's working with digital tools also a commitment to those challenges and a commitment to the fact that your tools are constantly going to be changing and evolving and you have to be adaptive. You have to even embrace that your tools might start collaborating with you. And it's really mm. exciting, but it also, you can lose your grounding in it and you can start to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to be famous and I'm going to be famous forever, or I'm going to be successful forever. And, and that's not generally the case. And the question is, are you still committed to your practice? Are you still committed to whatever your tool set is during, you know, the winters of one's own career, right? Okay, I have a lot of questions off the back of this, but I think what I'm most interested in is that uh, you and I, we kind of sit on this world divided by like pre-internet and, and after internet, right? But your mm -hmm. students have really only known this interconnectedness and I'm curious if you find that they have more flexibility in kind of thought or if there is kind of like a conformism that's being created on the internet? So generally I can never answer a question with yes or no. I, <laughs> we, uh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, um, but, but those are very good questions and I'd be happy to, to really address this because this is something I'm fascinated by, particularly because I've been teaching for 17 years. Right. And so with my students this semester, I was teaching both grad students and I was teaching undergrad first year. I call, I call that fresh people. So I was teaching fresh people and graduate students. And so there's quite a, you know, kind of gap between a person who's just starting college, 18 or 19 years old, and someone who's 24, 25, who's returning for um, a secondary degree, yeah, or a terminal degree. And, um, but with my fresh people, my first years, 
One thing I found, and I found this over the past couple of semesters, I teach this class in the fall called Ideation and Prototyping. And it's a really open-ended class because it's really about them exploring what their practice is and how mm. they're going to kind of shape their practice with you know, ideas and emerging technologies or existing technologies. And quite a few of my students this semester, I give them this, um, this project that they work on for like six weeks that is all about future casting. And so they have to create an experience, an art object, a, an, a product that exists 20 years in the future. And they're, you know, bringing it back to us on the day they present it and telling us why it's important to the future, whether it's a dystopic future, a, a protopic future, which is what I like to work with, protopia or utopic future. And a lot of my students were wanting to do analog things. So I'm finally getting to the point here. And I was really surprised by that because I couldn't wait, you know, after I threw away all my paintings, I couldn't wait to just go digital. And right. for, you know, a, a, almost a decade, it was just like, I'm doing digital work. And then now I'm open to maybe tomorrow I'll make a painting with oil paints, but mm -hmm. I don't think it has to be mutually exclusive anymore. I feel like we can really embrace that hybridity. I feel more comfortable working in a lot of, uh, you know, with digital interfaces today. I, I layers, you know, the versioning, all those things. But I found quite a few of my students, this one student made this entire kind of chimera, this um, totem or what's another word for it? Uh, almost like a Frankenstein out of all this old digital uh, or all this old analog media, like VHS tapes and and I mean, it was really fascinating with, you know, like analog signals with this uh, TV. And I think it's because a lot of these students, as you were saying, haven't had analog experiences yeah. and they do have an acuity that it's just like any kind of language. They have an acuity and a natural sensibility when working with digital tools that I don't think I have, you know, even though I started working with them over 25 years ago, it's still not the same as somebody who, you know, at three years old is exposed to a, a tablet. But right. like I'm seeing this, at least in some students, a kind of nostalgia for physical media, digital, or, you know, like something that at least incorporates some aspect of the physical world. So... Yeah, I, you know, I've been I've been traveling. I've been speaking to educators. It's it's not uncommon to hear this like again and again. I think there is such like an inundation of digital stimuli that reconnecting and working with your hands and the physicality and the tactileness of like these objects and kind of also knowing how we got to where we are um, is very interesting to somebody who's never just ex explored that or been on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any perceptions that they have about NFTs? Oh, yes. So I was teaching a grad colloquium class this semester with 173 students, all of our grad students in my program, IDM, Integrated uh, Design and Media. And I brought in quite a few people from the blockchain or crypto community. And at the end of the semester, of course, we get evaluated. And also the students write weekly on the various visitors we have come in. So I had Mad Penny from Art Blocks come in. I had Jesse Damiani. I had Nancy Baker Cahill. So, you know, some really stellar people. But we also have, for example, an abilities lab in my department or in my program, which is really focusing on accessibility in a really expanded uh, sense in terms of people who are otherly able, people with disabilities, and how are we addressing that in our technologies? And so I had quite a few people from that community come in as well. And then I had also people from UX. So Don Norman, who was kind of like the grandfather of UX design. So it was really across the spectrum because I wanted to kind of address topics outside of just blockchain and, and crypto um, communities. But what was fascinating is that some students, no matter who came in, they were just like, it's a pyramid scheme. I won't accept it. It's bad for the environment. Um, it's, it's not culturally responsible. 
and this is not going to be part of my practice while I had other students, which is just like the case of social media. And if we, as we've seen across the board, it's a very polarizing topic. I had other students who were already, you know, they have active careers. And one of my students was down in Miami and she was doing, you know, a panel at Scope and is selling a lot of work and, and is probably helping fund her graduate degree. So like more power to her. But it was fascinating to see that amongst my students, the conversation are as polarized as they have been on Twitter. I see that as well. Yeah. I see that as well. Yeah. Uh, I want to get back into also kind of like the promise of metaverse building. Uh, you know, also kind of in my travels, I've noticed that now all big cities kind of feel more and more the same, right? Mm. So there's less of these like subcultures around the world. I find that subcultures are being generated and proliferated more on the internet. We're connecting across like values instead of like physical geography. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people are beginning to translate all of these new unique ideas into neighborhoods, metaverse structures. Uh, does, does that excite you? Or do you see oh, something yes. similar? Yeah. Yeah. And just the whole kind of sociology of like, transforming spaces into places, right? Mm. That have cultural identity, that have shared values based on the people who start to populate these metaverses and the people who are building them and then opening them up to a community to dialogue and help build them. And I find that really exciting. I've taught quite a few social VR classes as well. And I find that in terms of VR particularly, there's so much more potential for web-based platforms than the kind of standalone. I still, you know, will teach standalone but I just feel like social VR is a direction that we've been headed in for a while. You know, the early kind of precursors to this were spaces like Second Life, which was considered virtual reality. You know, it's not always virtual reality as a headset. Like one of the first virtual reality experiences could have been the novel, for example. Right. right. Anything that transports us in this kind of imaginative way. And so... I just see so much potentiality. Somebody else who I've had come to my classes quite a few times is Wade Wallerstein. And one thing that, yeah. you know, I really agree with him on about these potentialities are that, you know, we don't have to emulate physical reality with walls and with, you know, the same kind of architectonic structures and the borders and all of the things that are actually increasingly problematic for us as a species. Right. Yeah. And so in these spaces, we have all of this new terrain to to develop, but we can't lose sight of the fact that we are still connected through our physical bodies. And what does it mean when we're kind of creating these spaces and that then are places right that are, you know, kind of experimenting with what form and function can be? Mm. Are they still accessible to enough people? So that's one thing, you know, I've thought about, and I'm actually venturing into writing a book this year about worlding and about, you know, kind of some of, of these things that I think we need to, to think about. I think a lot of people already are, but um, to think about deeply before, you know, we release certain things without ethical considerations, you know, I, I like to think about aesthetics a lot. I'm an artist, but also, mm -hmm. you know, onboarding experiences, what kind of um, kind of portals do you want to build for people so that, you know, my grandma Pansy May, I, she died a couple of years ago, she'd be 106 today, you know, that my grandma Pansy May could enter this or someone, you know, one other thing, because you're talking about you know, major metropolises, there's this kind of one dimensionality happening to things. And so much of this is through, you know, corporatization. And so we have like cookie cutter, you know, kind of um, representations all amongst us in, in base reality. And right. so we can really disrupt that in these metaverse spaces and these social VR spaces, whatever you want to call them. Um, but also, you know, still, what are, I, I don't remember, I used to could cite this, 70% 70, 70 of the world is online. That's a lot of people, but that's still not everyone, you know? Yep. And so, like, are we really thinking about things outside of our bubbles? Are we thinking about communities and reaching out to people? Are we thinking across um, a lot of different positionalities? I used age, but are we thinking about that across, of course, gender? That's been a big topic, yeah. but, you know, all of these different positionalities. And it's a lot to think about. And as a maximalist, I like, you know, head exploding emojis sometimes when I go down the rabbit hole trying to grapple with it all. 
Well, I just, you know, I, I love all of this train of thought. So much of this thinking we've tried to bake into the museum, right? The idea yeah. is that no longer can a centralized power begin to dictate what is culture, but you need representative, you need base up things kind of determining and uplifting what is globally representative and valuable in a system that is like so antiquated and centralized and really obviously white Western male dominated. Um, so how do we just re, I don't know, re-empower like, just give permissionless open access systems to anybody that might have internet access to share and develop and like uplift what is culturally relevant and representative to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is actually some, what would I say adjacency between a project I've been working on and of course your museum, which I, I just think is so significant. And we're both, you're one of the curators and I'm in the NFT by bi, uh, biennial right now. And yeah. I think that's a really exciting project. Um, I think Kevin um, Beist, is that how you pronounce his last name? I read him on Twitter B all the time. B-U-I-S-T. Yeah. 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 You know, he was talking about that in one, in an interview with you that uh, we needed an NFT biennial. He was he was talking about the Whitney biennial and that there's this mm. check in every two years. And so I was really excited when Julie Walsh, as a curator, approached me about this. And, you know, the, here we are. We we have this biennial now and it's traveling to 10 countries. But back to what you were talking about, accessibility, you know, kind of addressing Web 2.0 walled gardens. I mean, because that's when all of this, you know, started emerging and, and it really started closing down a lot of the experimentation. Even, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, where you had to be a one to one representation of yourself. I mean, I've had so many different avatars. I've had so many different kind of representations of myself online and ways I perform. Some people don't even know about certain representations, you know, and that really just seemed like it was, you know, setting parameters on something that's so novel and so kind of important to the 20, the latter half of the 20th century going into the 21st century, you know, like the printing press was right. And, um, and so, you know, opening these things up, you know, kind of re-establishing, de-establishing gatekeepers, all of that is, um, I think, really crucial and important. I think, though, there still are issues like with, okay, if, if everybody has a say, how do we resist complete anarchy? Right. And those are things still to work out. Right. Because we don't all agree. We don't all get along. We're not all going to agree that this is the right place for us to inhabit. And so there are, you know, ways that I think that we can approach this again, I think in terms of protopia, this idea that change occurs. I mean, there's been so much significant change from the 20th into the 21st century in terms of education, in terms of health. I mean, I know we just are living through still a global pandemic, but still compared to the 19th century, I mean, my, my grandparents were the, from the Appalachian mountains. They, you know, had eighth yeah. grade educations. They had, you know, one pair of shoes, you know, it's, it's very different now. Right. And um, so incremental change, Protopia is this idea that utopias throughout the 20th century led to bloody revolution. It led to the oppressed becoming the oppressors. So how can we work together thinking about incremental change, not just thinking about, you know, um, economics, socioeconomics, thinking about communities, thinking about that we don't, like a utopia a lot of times assumes that somehow we're all going to think the same thing. We don't think the same thing. But how do we still work together to make these communities more inclusive, to give space or place again to people with dissenting viewpoints, but that we can all, you know, kind of coexist in a way that's less fractionalized or, you know, less, you know, uh, I, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Well, you know, less of us all being in our like kind of exclusive bubbles, right? And look, I've always thought the promise of these digital spaces is that we could go in, we could rapidly iterate, we could develop deeper empathy, and we could come back and translate the lessons that we've learned into a physical reality once we have just yeah. A, B tested every possible scenario. Yeah. And that is incredibly exciting to me. And, and so much, I think again, like back to the space building, right? Meta wants to take you and put you in like a white box cubicle 
and like you can conjure up a pen and like a piece of paper, but no, you really want to give like vibrancy to the spaces. You want people to be so blown away that they start thinking new, that they are like recognized and comfortable with the unfamiliar so that when they meet somebody, right, they're, they're vulnerable in a way that allows each other to connect more deeply. Um, and these are the I, types of experiences we've always tried to facilitate with the art that we show, the exhibits, uh, the, the rooms that we present to people. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I actually, to that point, I mean, it just feels so unoriginal and getting back to that term magic, you know, mm. I mean, this is, we have the potential and what you're doing with your museum to make magic and doing it through, you know, cohorts, doing it through, um, uh, speculative thinking, speculative design, speculative art. And I was going to, I mentioned something earlier and then kind of, again, took a, a, another vector, you know, followed another vector of thought. I have been working on this project and, and it's just me and, a, you know, a few uh, studio assistants along the, the way over the past few years called Wonder Camera. And yeah. as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about it. And one thing that became really important to me, I first built it back in 2019, 2020 as a standalone VR piece. And then also as a physical installation and augmented reality, I really wanted it to be multimodal, multi-reality. And then I premiere it in San Francisco in uh, March of 2020. It closes within three days. And so I spent the summer translating it as a social experience. And then what became increasingly important to me, particularly because the whole idea of Wonder Camera, this idea of cabinets of curiosity that emerged as the precursor to museums, was highly problematic from a, you know, colonial standpoint, from, you know, the, the idea that we're living in a post-colonial world, but this was something that was coming at the time where it was primarily men who were like, look at all these wonderful things, exotica, you know, that I uh, collect from around the world. So I collected all my objects from the internet and I actually had physical objects in a cabinet. And then I, you know, either scanned them or modeled them. And I had over 900 objects in my wonder camera. But when I translated it to social VR, you know, I'd created all these taxonomies one was on decolonization and design, um, climate change and, you know, emerging and endangered species. Uh, com comedy is salvation and, and South, you know, all these different things. And oh, and sex and tech and, you know, destigmatizing these things. But I realized I'm not an expert on this. And then also, if I'm the person who's developing all those taxonomies, that's really again, problematic. So I started building wonder chambers for other people and just connecting them, right? Cool. And, you know, this social VR hub. And so I, I then, I have these seven avatars that represent these different taxonomies, you know, that I'm exploring my wonder camera. But then I found these experts and I'm like, hey, let me build a chamber for you. What would be important for you to preserve? What is the thing that, or what are the objects or things, dematerialized kind of uh, things that, you know, would be part of your world building and let me build that for you here and who knows where you'll take it later and then conduct an interview with you. So I've been doing those and conducting those since, you know, around um, 2021. And that's something I'm really excited about. And mine is, uh, is a small scale effort compared to yours, but I think all of us can contribute in any way that we can. Ooh, there's a lot to, there's a lot to unpack there. I think, um, Right, Be because of the nature of the digital object and its ability to be uh, reproducible, there is an ability to control the cultural context in which it's presented, right? So you no longer have like the museum with all the stolen artifacts that were taken out of these places, but suddenly, you know, you give the ability for everybody to access those objects and to present them these little bits of nostalgia, whether it's people's lives or any sort of creation. and. I think what it ultimately speaks to is our transition into the idea that, you know, we can be digitally abundant um, mm. and we do not have to rely kind of like on the physicality and that we can experience like a decommodification, a dematerialization that still contributes value and meaning and identity to ourselves. Um, and I'm, I'm just very, very excited about that and, and helping people recognize this as well. Yeah, yeah. So kudos to you in that project. It's, it sounds uh, incredible. We have, um, <laughs> yes, back for more. We have just a couple minutes left. Okay. So I, I definitely want to give kind of like the last words to you. And I want to let, you should definitely let everybody know where they can find you, 
how they could connect with you if that's something you're open to um, and sure. anything else yeah that you might want to share sure so you can find me at my website carlaganis.com I am still on Twitter. I know people have been, you know, having these kind of moral debates about whether they're going to stay or not, but I'm Carla Gannis there and on Instagram. And I will shout out because we have collaborated on several shows together that if you also want to follow on Instagram, my avatar, um, Carla Gann, cross-platform avatar for recursive life action, generative adversarial network is on there. And she's constantly debating me about a lot of these topics. So she might be fun to follow as well. Amazing. Um, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's say we can say goodbye. Goodbye, Bye. everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Colborn Bell. This is the Dementi Mocha podcast. We were joined today by artist Carla Gannis. Uh, and we thank you so, so much for being here with us. Thanks so much, Colborn. Take pleasure. care. Bye. 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 Breaking news.